Lord, I give you the highest praise because you are worthy. Yes, you are worthy. Lord, I give you the highest praise because you are worthy. Yes, you are worthy of my praise, praise. You are worthy of my praise, praise. Worthy of my praise, praise. Because you are worthy. Yes, you are worthy. Of my praise. The song I just sang, called Highest Praise, was written by a very dear friend of mine. He had been a worship leader at a church I've previously attended. And it really is the heart of this message because he is worthy. I've said it before, and I'll say it till the day I die. God, the creator of the universe, is not Burger King. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's not about having it your way. He's about us following his way. So often, people want to mold the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God into the character of their choosing. There's a quote by Patrick Morley that says, this is not exact, but this will be the gist of it. There is the God we want, and there is the God who is. They are not the same God. The turning point of our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. When we recognize because he is worthy of our praise. And there's a video that I listened to And the author of it is singing slash praying. And in the introduction to the video, says something to the effect of, For God has promised to take vengeance on our enemies. And therefore she goes forth and prays and praises. This is a massive, massive disconnect. First, God has not, as I read it, promised to take vengeance on our enemies. He says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That is not a promise that he will take vengeance on our enemies. That is him stating that vengeance is not our responsibility, but if it is to be meted out, it is his. And it's also important to remember that just because somebody we might deem is our enemy does not mean that they are God's enemies. If someone who is your enemy also belongs to God, God will do the correction. And there is a massive, massive disconnect when people equate vengeance with correction. It is vengeance excuse me vengeance is God's and God's alone but he and he alone will decide upon whom to take vengeance if we praise him because we expect him to take vengeance on those we've deemed our enemies we've just turned him into Burger King 
we are telling God, this is what we expect of you. Now perform. Because of a misinterpretation and in my opinion downright heretical misinterpretation of the word of God. Again, it doesn't promise that he will take vengeance on our enemies. It says that if vengeance is to be taken, it is his duty and not ours. So it's obvious to me that in this situation, somebody was worshipping with an incorrect heart. And this is not the only case. I mean, I've seen so many people who come to God because of what they expect Him to give them, not because of the true, true character of God. The more we recognize the character of God, the more we recognize how incredibly worthy He is. How incredibly worthy. I do believe that this disconnect of worshiping God because of what we want as opposed to who He is and because He is worthy is because we do not recognize the truest, deepest character of God. And the truest, deepest character of God is found in the many names and titles and roles revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures. He is God, Yahweh, Lord, I am that I am, the Most High God, the God of sight, Almighty God, Everlasting God, the rock, the Lord of hosts, the Lord will provide. The healer, the banner, the Lord who sanctifies, Lord is peace. The Lord is my shepherd, the Lord our maker, the Lord our righteousness, the Lord who is there. Other names attributed to the Father are Hashem, the great and mighty, awesome God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, the light, the light to the nations, fortress, tower of strength, hiding place. Do you get the protection here? Shield, rock of my strength, stone, cornerstone, portion of my inheritance, the branch, the crown and diadem, the tent peg, the bow of battle, the maker, the creator of Israel, the shepherd of Israel, the redeemer, deliverer, savior, king of Israel, Lord of all the earth, Shiloh, the arm of the Lord, Messiah, the prince. And in the New Testament, we have even more names, of course, Father, the God, the Father, the Father of lights, the Father of spirits, Elohim, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of peace, the living God, the Lord God, Lord Almighty, power, the Most High God, the Lord of armies, the majesty, the lawgiver and judge, sovereign, a consuming fire. And that's just the first person of the Trinity, the second person of the triune God, Jesus Christ himself, who is called Yeshua of Nazareth, the Son, the beloved Son, the root and offspring of David, Abraham's seed, the Son of Man, the Son of the Father, the only begotten God, firstborn of all creation, firstborn from the dead, the one who conquered the grave, Rabbi, King of the Jews, the Word of God, the life, the Lord, the man, the master, the savior of the world, the deliverer, the holy one, the prince, the living one, the stone, the chief shepherd, the shepherd and guardian. Again, this establishes the character of protection. The lion of Judah, the light of the world, the faithful witness, the amen, the bright morning star, the apostle, the author and perfecter of our faith, the mediator, the door, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the head of the body, the church, the heir of all things, God's mystery, 
the power of God, the beloved, the bread of life, the vine dresser. And then, of course, we cannot expect, excuse me, we cannot forget the third person of the Holy of the Holy Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of the living God, the eternal Spirit, the Spirit of Yeshua, the Spirit of Messiah, helper or comforter, clothing, a pledge, earnest money, fire, water, breath. All of these show the roles, the character the nature of God. And the more we learn the roles, the character, and the nature of God, the more we realize that we, who are so unworthy, can approach the throne of grace 24-7. Not because of who we are, but because of who He is. His character. And He summons us to Him because He is our Father. A loving Father who invites us into His presence despite who we are. That is the character of God. And the more we internalize the character of God, the more we realize that we give Him praise, not because of what we expect of Him, but because of who He is, because He is worthy. I cross-referenced Worthy and Praise at BibleGateway.com and I came up with exactly eight scriptural references. Now, just because there's only eight does not mean that uh, it's un- un- that the worthiness of our praise is unimportant. I would remind you that the book of Leviticus really is about the proper order of worship and the book of Psalms really is all about praise. I would like to also point out that while all praise is worship, all worship is not praise. The words are not synonymous, but they're not mutually exclusive either. The When the more contemporary churches separate certain songs of this is a praise chorus and this is a worship chorus, they are actually making an error because <laughs> all praise is worship. I mean, there's more contemplative worship and there's more, uh, more, and I don't want to say more joyful because that's not correct, but more boisterous worship. But all praise is worship, but not all worship is praise. And... So the first reference I came across is actually found in two places. It's 2 Samuel chapter 22 and Psalm 18. They're pretty much identical. This is a Psalm of David written after a time of intense political upheaval throughout the nation of Israel because Absalom had led what looked to be a very promising rebellion against his own father. And this is the time that after after the rebellion was quashed, that David just sat back and praised God. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Very important and special to me because this is one of my early childhood memory verses. And... So shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, certainly, David was speaking of his earthly enemies, his very son, Absalom. But I do believe he was also speaking of his most dangerous enemy, Satan himself. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemy. God inhabits the praises of his people. And I think a lot of people take the concept of 
spiritual warfare a bit out of context. I do believe many people who try to engage in spiritual warfare are trying to operate under their own power. We are not told to engage the enemy. We are told to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we know that God inhabits the praises of his people. So, when we call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and we praise Him, He is present. And we are, by definition, resisting the devil, because when we praise God, God is present, and the devil will flee. It's not lost on me that being in jail for the cause of Christ was probably not fun for Peter and Silas. Just saying, it probably wasn't. But they praised God, and he delivered them from the hands of their enemies. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. He delivers them. God, this omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, enjoys being with us, which should really be extremely humbling. But he enjoys us. He enjoys our presence. And he wants to be with us. Now, I would like to uh, speak about really quickly Again, part of the spiritual warfare is resist the devil and he will flee from you. And in Romans sixteen nineteen and 20, we read, Be excellent at what is good, be innocent of evil, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Again, when we pursue excellence, when we resist the devil by praising God, God will soon crush Satan underneath our feet. And that brings me to Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So the only one that is truly worthy of praise is God himself. So we think about him, we praise him, we're excellent at what is good and innocent of evil. We keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We keep our eyes on Christ, and we cannot fall into sin as long as we keep our eyes fixed. I know in my own life, the times that I've fallen into sin are because I lost sight of Christ. So, praise keeps our eyes focused and helps us serve God more fully with our obedience. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we have another psalm of David, a psalm of thanksgiving. And this is actually broken up over the course of about three different psalms in the actual book of Psalms. And we hear, we read this line, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And in another translation, we read, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Who is He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. I have said before, and I will continue to say, I do believe that the false gods that we are not to honor are real spiritual beings. I believe that they're fallen angels. I believe that the gods of the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Norse and all pagan gods are fallen angels. And I believe that the people who say 
that they're having a real spiritual experience, I believe they are. But he is our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is to be feared above all of them. First and foremost, he created them. He created them, and ultimately someday he will destroy them. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. We have so much confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ because he, again, inhabits the praises of his people. And we can have confidence in who he is because when we worship him, he is present. When we sing his praises, the devil will flee. And we understand through the nature of his character that even though he slay us, as Job said, yet I will praise him. Ultimately, God will do what God will do. And the ways of God are mysterious. But we can have confidence that he is sovereign and ultimately good, even though we do not understand his ways. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of praise and he is to be feared by feared we mean yes tremble because um, it's in James we read you say you believe in one God that is good but even demons believe and they tremble so yes they tremble with fear but we are called to have Fear of God, a trembling fear of God. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But also a respect for God, a love for God. And the more we fall in love with the character of God, as is revealed in his roles, in his titles, the more we just praise him for who he is. I'd like to talk real quickly about my prayer life. I pray kind of a formula prayer life. And some people would say that that's immature, whatever, which is fine. But I pray what I call the facts. Faith, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Notice supplication, asking him for stuff way over here at the end, all right? Faith. Professing our faith in Christ and, and speaking what, what we believe because if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that, or with, if we confess in our, with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Adoration, again, that's praising God because he's worthy, because of who he is, those very names. Confession, making known your sins before him, recognizing your sins. and Because he knows, he does know your sins, but he wants you to recognize your sin. So confessing thanksgiving again praising him first the adoration is praising him for what he who he is and thanksgiving is praising him for what he's done because he's worthy both because of his character and what he's done ultimately what he's done on that hill outside of jerusalem because he is worthy and finally supplication, asking for things. God wants to be worshipped for who he is, not because what we expect him to give us, which is why 
I really feel like the supplication really should be the last at the end. Faith, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So, so many people, their entire prayer life is all about, Dear God, please do this. Dear God, please do that. Dear God, please harm my enemies. Dear God, please give me a carb. Dear God, please, you know. Accept who he is, his character, and his sovereignty. And ultimately, you're less concerned about what you expect from God and more concerned about how worthy he is of prayer and praise. Finally, I would like to wrap up with Revelation, no S, 512. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. See, he was worthy because he was slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He is worthy of praise because of who he is and what he's done. We don't worship because of what we expect from God. We need to worship in spirit and in truth because it is his character. It is his pleasure for us to worship him. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. I hope after listening to this that you are renewed and invigorated with how worthy he is because of his character, his titles, his roles that he plays in your life. And you go forward and you just fall down and say, God, even though you slay me, I will still praise you. I'm going to play that song again, and I hope that you will sing along, because he is worthy. Thank you. Lord, I give you the highest praise, because you are worthy, yes, you are worthy. Lord, I give you the highest praise because you are worthy yes you are worthy of my praise praise you are worthy of my praise praise worthy of my praise because you are worthy, yes, you are worthy of my prayer.